Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Alicia Robb. She's founder and CEO of Next Wave Impact, which is a movement driving impact, diversity, and inclusion in early stage investing in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Alicia is also previously a senior fellow with the Kauffman Foundation for more than a decade. She has her PhD in economics from UNC Chapel Hill, and she's the co-author of three books, A Rising Tide, Financial Strategies for Women-Owned Businesses, The Next Wave, Financing and Investing Strategies for Growth-Oriented Women Entrepreneurs, and Race and Entrepreneurial Success. It is such an honor to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. I had the honor of hearing you speak at the Flywheel uh, Social Enterprise uh, Demo Day this year. Um, Tell me a little bit about uh, your personal story of innovation and where it began. Hmm. What what got you into this community? (laughs) Yes, it is not a a normal route into uh, venture capital, but I was, as you mentioned, uh, I have a PhD in economics. So as an economist by training, I actually started in the field of microfinance. Uh, in Central America, looking at women micro-entrepreneurs and how to get them capital to expand their businesses. Somehow that led me to being uh, in, at, into the SBA, where I was funded to do research on small business financing in the United States. And then I ended up doing my dissertation on uh, race, gender, and discrimination and entrepreneurial success. Wow. And that led me to being recruited by the Federal Reserve Board in the Greenspan days, where I did research on small business financing, access to capital, gender and racial gaps in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance. And that led me to the Kauffman Foundation, where I spent 12 years doing research and policy around these you know, similar uh, racial and gender gaps in high growth entrepreneurship, which led me to doing research in the gender and racial gaps in um, the investor side of the equation, which is actually, they're even the gaps are even larger. So, mm. as part of that last book you mentioned, Next Wave Impact, I researched um, why we don't see more women in early stage investing. Um, we know that women get about three percent of the venture capital. Um, women founders. Women founders, and yeah. um, one of the reasons why is because most of the investors are white men, and they like to invest in other white men. And I thought one way to get more capital to women and people of color was to get more women and people of color on the investing side of the equation. Yeah. So that's how thinking about how to design a more innovative way to bring people across the barriers that stop them from being early stage investors. And I ran a pilot fund when I was still at the Kauffman Foundation, um, trying to really mobilize women to become early stage investors. Um, And that's how I ended up founding Next Wave Impact. Um, I decided I didn't want to just do early stage investing. I wanted to invest in early stage impact companies, companies that were for profit, but also having a social impact. And so I'm running an impact fund now with 99 women, uh, 25 women of color, and we're investing in impact companies from around the country. It's incredible. How many companies are is Next Wave investing in currently? Yeah, our current fund has invested in 13 companies. Um, one is in Cincinnati, Connexus. Connexus, yes. Which is Union Rod. Um, he, uh, he's our one male entrepreneur. <laughs> we have 13 companies and 12 of them are women-led. Um, but Rod's company is looking at supply chain diversity and so yes. very much impacting women and people of color. Yes. Um, so we're really excited to have um, Connexus in our portfolio. Can you tell me a little bit more about how the research you did in the earlier days of your career led you to uh, the findings that you needed in order to design a program like like the pilot that you built inside of Kaufman, which eventually became Next Wave? What were those findings that you uncovered around uh, why it's important to build into the, the venture capital side of the table and not only support uh, more female founders? Mm-hmm. Sure. So really, the first part of the research was really just looking at the data and documenting what the re- what the situation was. So looking at, you know, the percentage of entrepreneurs that are women, percentage of companies that are um, led by people of color, looking at the industry distributions by these um, owner demographics and seeing where these companies were located um, and really looking at the financing patterns and credit market experiences 
um, of these companies, really realizing the differences in access to capital and the differences in financing patterns by these different groups. So that really led me to looking at um, the, the, this VC number that's so stark. You know, 2.8% of women-led companies um, receive uh, VC capital. Um, one About 1% 1 of African Americans, 1% of Latino entrepreneurs get, receive venture capital. If you look at Latinas and women that are African American, I mean, they're tiny, tiny, tiny percentages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking at that and researching why this whole thing around homophily came up, you know, we like to hang out with people that look like us. We like to start companies with people that look like us. We like to invest in companies by founders that look like us. Mm -hmm. So one of the main reasons why we see most of the venture capital going to white male-led companies is because most of the investors are white males. So one of the ways to build a pipeline of capital and investors going to women and people of color is to increase the diversity of those investors. So by then thinking, okay, how do we get more investors? The research I did really looked into why we don't see more women and people of color investing in this asset class. And the research showed a lot of people had never even heard of it. Like, what is angel investing? Sure. What, what, is, what is an early stage deal? Um, so part of it was just not being aware of this asset class and the fact that there are angel investors that do this kind of thing. Another reason was they didn't know other angels. Uh, another was they didn't see deal flow, so they didn't see that there were companies that they could possibly invest in. Mm -hmm. Another reason was they didn't know how. And then I think the other reason was they were risk averse to making that one, that first investment into a high risk company. So I designed a learning by doing fund that overcame all of those barriers. We designed a learning by doing fund where it had a, a, a low minimum. So most venture capital funds, you have to invest at least $250,000 to get in. Sure. We said, all right, let's have everyone invest $10,000. We'll put together 99 women because mm -hmm. that was the SEC limit for the number of investors into a fund. <laughs> and we had a million dollar microfund with 99 women. And this fund was led by an investment committee of experienced angels. They would mentor the new and emerging angels. Um, we would provide education and training. And that $10,000 investment wouldn't go to just one company. It would be diversified across a portfolio of companies. So here we are getting across all of those barriers, you know, assist, you know, learning and do learning by doing education and training, mentoring, diversification, get to hang out with a community of really cool women. And, I, I, I pitched it to Kaufman and they said, oh, that's a great idea, but it'll take us like five years to get through the lawyers. Just go do it and we'll uh, <laughs> fund the education and training piece. And so I did. And I launched Incredible. the pilot. We did it. And then we did it simultaneously in Europe. So we had nearly 200 women from 25 states and 25 countries um, doing these two pilots. When we finished that, looking back, you know, what worked well, what didn't, we decided that we would do a that learning from that, so our, my own learning by doing, I decided I really wanted to focus on impact, like companies that not only yeah. were for profit and scalable, but actually companies that were solving real challenges that our world is facing right now. So I launched Next Wave Impact Fund in 2017 with a similar model, 99 women, but I was very um, intentional about bringing more women of color. So 25 of them are women of color. And then we're building this portfolio of very diverse entrepreneurs um, in as our investments. The work is incredible. The learning by doing model fascinates me. And I want to know more about the role that storytelling and story sharing, sharing successes, fears, failures, what sorts of stories do you hear circulating between mentors and mentees to help uh, sort of guide their paths and increase their confidence? Because that seems like uh, such a barrier to, you know, besides not knowing how, there's that risk aversion fact, which sort of comes from fear of failure, fear of not knowing. So how do you sort of see story sharing happening inside of those relationships? Hmm, that's an interesting question. So one of the things I've often got pushed back on, why 99 women? Why not, you know, let some men in? And one of the things I, I found was women actually feel more comfortable sharing their sh their stories, sharing their fears, sharing questions that they might not ask in a room of strangers um, that they would be willing to do with um, a group of women. And so I really feel like that comfort level was really important. I mean, we, 
encourage women to not just be in our silo of our amazing group and and, and to get out into the you know the real world and 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 everything that um, and be represented in, in everywhere else as well. But I think that ability to have a community of a collaborative group that's really supportive is a way to, that just opens up um, people's willingness to share their fears sure. and share their share their stories. And I think it's the same way with the entrepreneurs. So many of these women that are entrepreneurs, they've been pitching to white men for the last, you know, however long. And it's so refreshing. We hear again and again how refreshing it is to to pitch, to present our company to someone who actually gets it. For someone who's not going to ask me, you know, what happens if you get pregnant? Or how are you going to balance your 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 children with your company? And how are you going to do a scalable? What does your husband think? You know, mm-hmm. things like you yep. c- you can't imagine these I've questions heard. still get asked, and they do. They do. They do. <laughs> I've heard it from so many female founder friends. Yes, and so it's it's wonderful to be a community that these women feel comfortable telling their stories in a way that they know that we're not judging them like they might feel judged by white men. I am so fascinated by how inclusion can happen by by virtue uh, of sort of being able to change the way that communication occurs. So how does a, a woman of color founder pitch differently to a woman of color investor uh, versus a, a, an investor with another identity? Have you heard certain, I mean, you already sort of spoke to this, but I want to dig down even more. Are there certain strategies that they can, it sounds like some of the the doubts and the, the, the risks to from a male investor, typically a, a white male investor's perspective, um, can really be limiting or are sort of judgmental of character, of capacity, and less about, uh, you know, sort of the confidence in that, in the woman, the founder. So it sounds like that's one area where having, having another woman to be pitching to, that, that part is lessened. And perhaps we're actually talking about the opportunity in the business more so than than the capability uh, of the the talent. But I think I've actually seen that. I mean, I'm in an angel group where I'm often the only woman in the room. And so when I see women pitch there, it it there does seem to be a different dynamic. The other thing we do differently is we do virtual presentations. Since we have investors all over the country, we do it by Zoom. And so they present from their home or office in a in a, in a video set, setting. And so they're not coming in and standing up with a bunch of people looking at them in seat, you know, seated around them and and they're presenting. So it's it's a diff- it's a whole different um dynamic there as well. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like and they they've, you know, obviously commented, you know, when they do present to us how what a different experience it is. I mean, there's a lot of research now that shows, you know, both women and men, male investors ask different questions of male entrepreneurs than female entrepreneurs. I don't have the um, counterfactual because we only really look at women and people of color in presentation. So I don't know what questions we would have, would ask white men. Sure. But um, certainly in the research, it shows men are asked more opportunity type of questions. Yes, or more futuristic. Yeah. And women are asked more preventative questions. And there's, you know, now research that shows how you can train yourself to answer a preventative question with a promotional answer to kind of flip it. And Ah. so you don't kind of get sucked into always asking prevention questions with prevention answers, but you actually switch it out since there is this unconscious bias of both women and men to to ask these questions. We, a bunch of us uh, women, we had gone to San Diego for a training on unconscious bias, and it really was fascinating. I don't know if we're just how we are are wired but i really i did see myself asking questions that were preventative type of questions rather than promotional and and really training yourself to ask in a way that really allows them to um project in the positive growth way and not be defensive so some of your research also looks at how likely a female founder is to even ask for funds in the first place to get to that point of pitch and that they're far less likely to ask for venture funds. 
Can you speak to that research and, and some of those findings, what, what you think about that, how that's informed some of the programs at Next Wave? Mm -hmm. So this is actually both on the debt side and the equity side. So if you look at credit market experiences, women are much more likely to not apply for a loan because they fear they'll be turned down. Um, even though they don't have differences in um, approval rates. So they think they're fearing they'll be turned down, but in reality, they have very similar um, approval rates for, for bank lending. Based on like credit score or Controlling other, for all of that, yeah. they have the similar types of um, approval rates, correct. Um, so for venture capital, um, yes, I do think women are seeking it less because venture capital is structured in a way that necessitates a company's growth path to be this hockey stick growth mm -hmm. where they have to sell their company or go public in order to get a liquidity event to get their investors their returns. And a lot of women and people of color are starting businesses so they can grow and scale and build a big business and not sell it. And so part of the reason why there are fewer women going out for venture capital is that f financial structure isn't really what they want. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is really rethink the VC model and think about how we can better design financial structures of investment products that work for both the entrepreneur and the investor in the sense of getting the investors a return in a timely manner, but allowing the companies to actually keep their company. So um, what are you coming up with? Well, one of the things we're going to do with our next uh, fund is do more investments in a flex equity model. So it is investing, getting equity, but actually having a plan and a path in place for entrepreneurs to buy back their company after five years. So buy back that part of the equity. Interesting. Over five years. There's some other structures that people are playing around with, with like revenue-based financing and so forth. But we've got to get creative. We've got to think outside of the box. The median VC returns are basically zero. And so it's not like venture capital is working for many. Um, and there's, you know, there's just there should be better ways to do this. So as we think about alternative structures and and different models, we want to really um, find things that work for both the entrepreneurs, especially women and people of color, um, as well as offer investors a return. In terms of approval rates, um, you know it's funny about women and men, and one difference that we've seen, and I saw anecdotally in the research I was doing with the book, was men will go in with a, you know, idea written on a napkin and ask for a million dollars. Women will be like five years in with a, you know, profitable record and be like, can I, you know, like yes. really timid. And so I think part of it is really getting more confidence in the women that they have these great business opportunities. Um, another thing we see is that when women get, they hear no, they take it personally, more personally, and they stop asking. Ah. And we have to educate the women entrepreneurs that men are hearing 99 no's before they hear a yes, I if see. they hear a yes. Mm -hmm. Don't take this personally. You have to find the right investor fit. Take the feedback that these investors are giving you in terms of what is an investable, scalable um, company. But just because they're saying no doesn't mean that this isn't something that should be pursued. But mm -hmm. So really incorporate the feedback that they're offering to make your company presentation um, a better investment possibility. But I do think um, part of the reason is women stop asking after they hear no after uh, too many times. So persistence is critical. Persistence is very critical. Adaptive feedback, continue to, to go and go and go. And we are actually better investments. I mean, we're so scrappy and we're so resilient that actually women make better investments. And I think as we get more um, evidence that shows the superior returns of investing in this underrepresented group of entrepreneurs. Um, we're going to see more and more white males going in because it's not just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing smart. to do. It's yeah. the business, it makes business sense. Just like I think here in Ohio, there's so many overlooked entrepreneurs here. Most of the venture capital goes to California, New York, and Boston. Well, there's great ideas and companies everywhere. So our fund specifically looks for companies outside of those three states and looks for companies that are in uh, these overlooked areas. Because again, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do.
I, I couldn't agree more. How many pitches do you hear in a year? Ooh, a year. How about a month? <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I would probably, I hear dozens. Yeah, yeah, dozens. So you probably have some advice about some keys to success. First of all, I want to know, before we dive into advice, how much time do founders typically get to pitch to you or your team or your or your angels? Once they're selected to present to us, they get about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, often when you're just running into folks and hearing them on the fly, it can be as little as two to five minutes. Mm -hmm. So, But once you're selected by our fund to actually present, then you get about 15 minutes. But I think what's really important is... You know, you're talking about storytelling, um, especially for technical founders. Um, it can be really challenging for sure. them to, they have such passion for what they're doing, and it doesn't always translate into um, a story that we as investors who are not technical uh, understand. So that's where it's really important to tell a story in a way that is understandable by us, but shows your passion and commitment for the why of of beginning this company in the first place. So definitely passion. If that's not there, is it just, it, you could have the best idea in the world, but if passion doesn't resonate through. Then we see dozens of pitches every month and you're just not going to make the cut. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, entrepreneurship is a hard road. Everyone talks about how everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Everyone doesn't want to be an entrepreneur. Like 10% of the population yeah. is <laughs> are self-employed. Everyone else wants to work in a company, have a stability, sa stability sa you know, salary, employ, you know, health insurance and so forth. Um it's not for everyone and I think if you don't have that passion and that commitment to seeing that um through then you're not going to be successful, and we can see that. Yeah. And the second factor you mentioned was really understandability. So especially in, in technical fields and most of the top innovation industries at this point in terms of the ones that are highest growing, it is highly technical. Everything from cybersecurity to uh, AI to, uh, you know, incredible uh, progress in automation. So trying to translate sometimes things that are invisible or even scientific too. So chemical manufacturing and processing and agriculture, like there's a lot of invisibility to what happens in digital worlds. Um, how Can you give some examples of pitches where the tech founder did a really good job of bringing something highly complex to life and making it understandable and accessible to the investors. <laughs> yes, it's going to be a bad. It's going to be a not a great ending story because the the company ended up failing. But it was a cybersecurity firm, and they were so passionate and made it so understandable. I, as a non technical investor, really felt the passion and knew that they knew what they were doing. So I was not investing with an angel group at the time. It was just me. So I didn't have the technical expertise actually to do the, you know, the level of due diligence that I could have done with an angel group or a fund. Um, so I, I bought into the passion and so forth because it was a compelling story and there is a, a huge need. I mean, cybersecurity is addressing mm -hmm. one of the most, um, you know, biggest challenges that we're facing right now. Um, unfortunately, it didn't, it, didn't go, it didn't go well and they failed, not probably because well, of the, you know. <laughs> it, well, you know, we're living in a post-Theranos world. You are not the only investor to have fallen into that trap. And I think... Okay, wait. So Theranos, let's talk about that. Okay. There were no technical investors that knew anything about that industry that invested in that company. Yep. Those were all non -technical. There were hardly any publications there, peer-reviewed publications. Yeah, none of the board members were academically affiliated or had research backgrounds. It, it was kind of incredible. But th there was a great article that came out last year, and I'll link it in the show notes. Um, and it was all it was a study, essentially, of healthcare unicorns and how often they're publishing. And the numbers were abysmal. So it, and it was starting to rise, the, the, the number of, of healthcare, you know, billion-dollar or more venture-backed healthcare, health tech startups, um, but it's the number of publications and the validation of their research and their findings is still ridiculously small and low. So, but I, that publication sort of came out right after the Theranos debacle happened and that company folded in a big dramatic way. And 
we're starting to see, I think, a, a larger expectation that startups should be getting validation for their findings, that they should have technical members on their board, that that's a necessity, but it's still not the majority. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, Theranos is such an interesting story because years ago I met a competitor in California and she, also a female founder, had a similar type of product and they were r earlier stage and raising capital. And I asked her about Theranos because they had at that point raised, I don't know how many, hundreds of millions of dollars. And she <laughs> said to me, she's like, I'm not convinced that that works. Something's not right about that. And I thought to myself, my God, what do you know? You're early stage. You haven't raised hardly any money. And this woman's raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And there it was. She was a technical founder and she knew what yeah. others didn't know. Yeah. Um, and there was definitely, I mean, there were technical people inside that organization. And there was definitely a level of sort of turning their heads in the other direction, too. So there was legitimate, unethical. Yeah. Right. And I just wanted to be clear, the cybersecurity one it's, it was that. just a matter of not finding the product market fit. <laughs> right, and right. Not, you know, not it's, that it's they were doing anything investing. unethical. Not that they were doing yes, anything unethical. Yes, it yeah. just wasn't, um, it didn't work out. And that's yeah. part of the game with angel investing, which is why we train our early stage investors to build a portfolio of companies because they're not all going to survive. <laughs> right. And, and so now, uh, certainly next wave is about, you know, building into a diverse portfolio of companies through a learning by doing Fun is it, is it a fund of funds in that no, way as well? No, it's just a, no, a it's learning just, by doing funds. Yeah. Okay, learning by doing fun, and so your your LPs have diversified their risk across companies and their right. So with together. their investment, and everyone invested between thirty thousand and three hundred thousand, it's diversified acro across a number of companies. So we plan to have about sixteen companies in the portfolio, and then with first stage investments, and then we'll do just follow on investing in subsequent rounds of those existing companies. So the yeah. portfolio will be about sixteen, and we're thirteen in. It's incredible. So accessibility, understandability, validation, let's add that. We've already talked about passion. Um, they have to have validation, though, too. And, and that doesn't mean that they won't struggle to have something like a product market fit. or. Um, but well, some other? of the validation we do look for is yes. product market fit. Yes, yeah. Um, one of the things that we're concerned about right now is that we're seeing some founders of color that are a little too early for us right now, our current fund. And they don't necessarily have the friends and family round to get them to the traction level of validating their product market fit. And so one of the things we're planning on doing with our next fund is actually having a carve out of about a million or two to do five or six pre-seed investments each year in founders of color and get them that pre-seed funding with the friends and family round and then give them additional mentorship and advising and helping them scale to that next seed stage. That's incredible. What other advice do you have uh, let's start with founders, but then I want to also hear your advice for women who are interested in becoming uh, investors as well. So what advice do you have to founders as they go to pitch and to um, to consider funding options and build those investor relationships? Hmm. So I would say for the founders, really be clear on your why. Like, why am I doing this? Why, why am I so passionate about it? One of the things we see is if the founders come to this venture, founding this venture because of some personal story, it really resonates that we see that, you know, passion and commitment as coming from a authentic source from within. Like, this is why they're committed to making sure this is a success. And then we want to be part of that. We want to help them get there. Um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Advice for women who want to become investors. Ah, uh, well, part of the reason I did that pilot, um, in the called you know the Rising Tide pilot, when I was still at the Kaufman Foundation, was because in that research I was doing for the book, I asked venture capitalists and angel investors, "What would you recommend for new investors?" And the things they were telling me. Um, you know, Elizabeth Krauss from Merge Lane was like, look at 20 deals before you ever make your first investment. Um, several were telling me, don't look at the investment like a consumer. Like, I want to buy that product as a consumer. You have to look at the investment opportunity from the investment standpoint. And standpoint. Does that investment make sense? Not that you don't want that product. You might want that product, but does the investment make economic sense? Um, and all these things they said, I was like, oh, man, it would have been really nice to know these things before I had done all this angel <laughs> investing. And then I thought, yes, why not 
take those learnings from all these people and my own mistakes in the first few years I was doing it and translate that into a knowledge base where er the women can start with not having to make those same mistakes we all made when we were first getting started. There's no <laughs> sense in reinventing the wheel and just making those same mistakes. We've already learned. So please benefit from our learnings. And so we have a bunch of free resources on our website, nextwaveimpact.com. There's an investor page, education page, and there's tons of 60-minute, 20-minute, five-minute videos and briefs on everything around early stage investing. So you can just at any time, you have a cup of coffee, having a glass of wine, you can say, okay, what are term sheets. I love it. due diligence. And so, but join an angel group, join a fund. It's really hard to build a portfolio of early stage investments over, you know, a five or six year period without doing it full time. So if you do something like a fund or an angel group, you kind of share the responsibilities of the due diligence. You benefit from other people's perspectives and going through and evaluating opportunities. And you also can you know, share the the responsibilities of continuing those engagements post investment and helping those entrepreneurs scale. It's really hard to do that all on your own. So, yes. joining an angel group or a fund is a great way to do that. It's such good advice. Last question: Tell me your favorite innovation story that you've ever heard. Oh my <laughs> no god! No pressure. No pressure. Or just tell one. me yours, and then I'll and then I'll that'll oh, trigger a memory for me. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Um, okay. One of mine is, this is more of a storytelling innovation than it is sort of an actual product or service design. But uh, a couple of years ago, GE uh, projected the faces of women in science onto the ceiling of Grand Central Station in downtown New York and made it look sort of like constellations and put their names next to it and the years that they lived and sort of that was it. It was the, the faces. So you'd walk out of the subway station and immediately sort of look upward and you'd be surrounded by the faces of these famous women scientific innovators. And it created all of this social media conversation. People you know, immediately got out their phones and took pictures and uh, and it inspired people to go do more research into their, those innovators' lives, and it brought visibility to those women in a really powerful, kind of immersive way. And they left it there for a few days uh, before it kind of came down. But even at, at Demo Day for Flywheel, seeing the use of personas inside of different pitches. So I, I thought it was really resonant when uh, Moxie Girl, when she sort of showed us, this is what a, a young girl lacking confidence in middle school looks like, and here's how my product addresses that need. Just to see, put a face and a name to the person who's ultimately going to be impacted by that innovation made it resonate on an emotional level. And then, of course, she ticked off all the other boxes beautifully, Lydia, the, the, the co-founder, mm -hmm. um, in terms of product market fit and how they were going to, you know, their ultimate customers, behavioral health and primary care providers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it sort of, they didn't just start from addressing the needs of primary care providers or behavioral health specialists. They started from the patient's uh, and so it's a B2B strategy for the business, but keep they, they, they did such they a beautiful job. Yeah, they kept person. their their customer's customer at the heart of their story. Well, and I think that's probably the commonality of the really great pitches that we see. Those that actually are able to tell a personal story, you know, say a you know family member died of, you know, some health disease and that that um, motivated them to really go into research and finding, okay, I'll tell you one. There's a company that um, her husband got a diagnosis of Parkinson's and it was pretty devastating. But so she just self-studied and learned about the microbiomes and how you could actually treat things. Year he's alive years later and he's healthy. And she turned this into a company that's able to provide these, these, um, but basically microbiotics, I guess, um, to others and and are finding other uses. And now all of a sudden you're hearing in the last several years about the gut bacteria and how it is really absolutely essential and integral to our, our health and light our yes. health and overall well being. And yes. I think we're gonna see and more stress, and more startups well. in this. But her motivation and her self study and her dedication to create something that had a amazing impact on this 
her husband yeah. was, was such a compelling story. So um, it comes back to it comes love. back to this <laughs> passion, s- passion, and having this story of your why and mm-hmm. entrepreneurs that are able to translate that into um, something that investors can see and understand. Um, and as you said, it resonated with you when there was that person that you could connect with. It's the same thing with like donations and so forth. You see something about a million children and it's like, eh, what can I do? But save one child and all of a sudden yeah. you're like, oh, wait, I can make a difference. And yes. so seeing how people are so personally motivated to make a difference um, and using, you know, examples of individuals that are personally affected, it's very, very compelling way to show your impact. I, uh, Alicia, I'm so grateful that you could come to the studio and have this conversation. Thank you so much for making time to be on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's been great to be here and great to see all of what Cincinnati offers here. It's a great community and you're very lucky. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 